Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back. I hope you had a fantastic break. We're in uh, week nine of the Cyber Policy Seminar Series. Uh, I'm delighted to um, introduce my colleague, Stephanie Reich, who's got perhaps the best title of the seminar series uh, this term. And um, she also was a uh, colleague on the National County Sciences Committee looking at uh, social media adolescence and well-being. So she's presenting some new work to us today and uh, really excited to have her coming, visiting all the way from Irvine, our neighbor uh, slightly down south. And so please uh, join me in, in welcoming Stephanie. Thank you. Um, I actually had given like the PG academic title and then I said, if you want something a little edgier, here's another one. Uh, and it actually used it. Um, I, but I said they cleaned it up because there's some asterisks. Mine didn't have the asterisks in there. So uh, it's a nice addition to it. Um, so thank you for having me. Um, I am a fast talker. So if I get going too fast, feel free to give me like a little hand gesture and I'll slow down. Uh, we were talking about that on the way here that um, Californians though, seem to be OK with fast talking. Um, okay, so I thought I would start with just a little bit about my background, um, and then I'm going to define some terms um, that I'll be using, and then as Jeff mentioned, it's kind of a newer area, and unlike a lot of the talks that the center has, which tend to be more summative of a whole body of work, um, I really was trying to think of some stuff that was uh, policy and research relevant for what's kind of happening in this moment in time, and so there are two very descriptive and exploratory studies that we um, one we just completed and one that's still underway that I wanted to share, but I'm going to try to bring in the uh, findings and make some policy recommendations and kind of next steps, and hopefully some of the findings will motivate you to look in this area as well. Um, and then we get to have a larger discussion, and I get to fulfill my lounge singer fantasies by holding this microphone while we talk later, so I'm very excited about that. Um, so a little bit of my background is I'm trained as a, a developmental and community psychologist. And so what that means is I'm really interested in child development and how that process and the context and the people, actors, and um, interactions around youth. And so while I've done media research since my postdoc, it's really the media itself is not my focus as much as the kids and how it fits with them and well or is problematic. And so it's a much more developmental kind of framing to my work. Um, so as uh, we talk about a lot is that technology changes pretty rapidly. Um, when I started doing this work, it was like MySpace, it was modem dial-ups, it it's changed a lot in my career. Um, but the way children develop doesn't really change. It's very predictable the way it unfolds, the developmental needs and capacities of how they progress. Um, and so I'm really interested in how that intersects with the affordances that technology provides for you. Uh, so when we think about digital development, and uh, we think about development and digital devices and their intersection together, especially in the second decade, that period from uh, 10 to 20, um, we see that media use is pretty robustly used in service of developmental needs, pretty consistently, and we found this since our very early studies on you know, MySpace. <coughs> um, so I'm gonna highlight just a few of those that are really important. One is identity development, that adolescents are really trying to figure out who they are, they're um, exploring, they're trying out different identities, they're presenting themselves in different ways, um, and, and social media has been a place that has provided really unique opportunities to do that, and we have robustly found that for about two decades, that um, the ways you can search out information, the way you can portray it, the smaller networks you can, and bigger networks you can expose that to, the kind of feedback you get, and it's pretty robust finding. Um, another aspect of adolescence really important is autonomy, right? It's the second decade, you just get a lot more freedom and be become more autonomous. Youth get their, they have a cell phone sort of in the second uh, decade, they are on social media pretty consistently, um, they have more adult responsibilities, they babysit, they learn to drive, they hold jobs, like so much is happening in this time period. Um, and then additionally, intimacy and closeness is really important. So friends uh, from a biochemical, cognitive, uh, neurological to an emotional affective piece have so much importance in adolescence. Um, and there's a high need for intimacy uh, with friends and romantic partners. The second decade is also a period in which puberty is happening. And so it's because of this big biochemical change, it's another sensitive period. Early childhood, I work with diapers to the end of, uh, sometimes college, but usually end of high school. Um, sort of two big sensitive periods, adolescence being one of those. And so with puberty, you have a lot of changes in your body, the way you look, the way it functions. You have big changes in your hormones. Um, 
you, the changes in how you look and respond affect how other people see you and respond to you. Intersects really interestingly with your identity presentations and what that looks like and how you're trying out more adult roles and people are responding to you. Um, and then additionally, you just have increased interest in sex, right? You're more aroused, you have more interest in learning about it, you think about it more often, you, and you may engage in sexual behaviors, right? And so this is a sort of a thing that happens in the second um, uh, decade. <laughs> and then interestingly, you still continue to have this emotional closeness that can, in, includes both the platonic and the romantic. And I don't know if anyone saw the scholar and, uh, and screen, the screens and scho uh, scholars and storytellers um, that out of UCLA did a report, came out a couple weeks ago, where adolescents actually wanted less romantic sex scenes and they wanted more platonic relationships, more A's, that they really want the intimacy part without the sex part. Um, so there's sort of these changes that are happening in this time period. So it's not surprising when we think about kids having more autonomous use of technology, being on social media, having these personal devices, and then also having all this added interest in sex that you would start to see those d digital devices being used in, um, exchange for sex in, in exchange around sexual content. Um, and so most often this is called sexting. Raise your hand if you've heard the term sexting before. Right, it's pretty common in the popular press. It's for those who don't. It's basically texting around sex, right? So it's the sharing of images, videos, text focused on sexual activity or body parts, right? And it has this like old SMS piece of texting, but it's any kind of messaging, right? It could be direct messaging through social app, media apps. It could be on chats, blogs, forums, all kinds of spaces, right? But any of this digital community communication around sex is what we're calling sexting. Um, uh, and it's really popular in the press, right? We see headlines around this all the time. There's the sense that like, it's just a normative part of adolescence. All teens are doing them. A chunk of are doing it. I have a colleague in the EU who's like, stop telling teens not to sex. They're gonna do it anyway. Teach them how to do it safer, right? Like it's such a, a big part of how the media hype is. Um, and, and, and about 10 years ago, we saw that a lot and we were sort of interested, is that true now with COVID and social distancing and more digital uptake? And so it's part of what inspired um, what's coming forward. Um, some other terms that you may not hear as often, one of which is cyber flashing. Now raise your hand if you've heard the term cyber flashing before. Yeah, so it's less common. So cyber flashing is a form of, of sexting, but it's one that's unwanted. Much like a flasher on the street, it's a digital exposure, right? You're getting sent pictures or videos, typically of genitals, uh, breasts, sex acts, things that are unwanted. Um, and cyber flashing is an unwanted form of sexting. Sextortion, raise your hand if you've heard of sextortion. So that's a little bit more popular in the press. And so um, sextortion is basically extortion around sex. Um, so it's typically a threat of revealing some kind of um, sexual images um, or some kind of threat of doing something unless you give something in exchange. Uh, most often that can be money, sexual favors, um, providing more images, or perhaps introducing perpetrators to other people who could be future victims. And all of these are a form of image-based sexual abuse, IBSA. So it's sort of all these things that are the taking, sharing, and creating of content um, without consent, right? It includes like revenge porn, sextortion, deep fakes, cyber flashing, like that whole genre of stuff. Um, Okay, so when we think about sexting research in the US, and, the, and we've been doing research for quite a long time in the US, there's a, a bunch of meta-analyses now around sexting. Um, but there are, I think, some important gaps. One is which most of our research is really focused on sort of middle to later adolescence. So, um, you know, mo nowadays, 11 and 12 year olds pretty much all have phones, right? That's a pretty consistent finding, but we're not really asking about these behaviors until much later. And pubertal timing is uh, going down, so most of the 11 and 12 year olds are going through puberty, right? So there's a reason that we should think about this group that's been largely ignored, this sort of end of middle childhood, beginning of adolescence. Um, most of the sexting research in the US is really focused on reciprocal relationships. It's sort of framed a way that like, couples wanna share information back and forth, or it's peer to peer. There's a little bit on sort of unwanted or growing legs and moving on without consent after you share it kind of framing, but in the US it's really a, a framed as, the research is really framed around as a peer kind of process. Um, our samples in the US, not exclusively, but disproportionately tend to be white, they tend to be middle class, and they tend to be cisgender. So we're sort of like missing out on how sexting behaviors may be happening or not within other uh, groups in our society. And we don't focus that much on the feelings part of it, right? Like how do youth feel about these images and when they're wanted or unwanted and what are sort of the consequences of that process? 
And we overwhelmingly don't look at cyber slashing. We don't really consider very much about the very unwanted exposures that happen. And um, in the EU, the UK, Australia, it's actually quite common uh, to study these areas and, and they find it pretty consistently. In the US, we haven't really looked for it very much. Um, so that led us to those questions of sort of like, what is happening right now? So we wanted to know what are the sexting experiences of a more diverse sample of 11 to 18 year olds? And we wanted to be sure to include cyber flashing because it's been largely omitted. Um, and we wanted to know how frequently these experiences were consensual or they were unwanted. How much are they really like a, a reciprocal, enjoyable type of thing and how much are they an image-based sexual abuse? Um, and then we wanted to know if there were certain demographics that were more at risk of, um, ha of having wanted or unwanted sexting experiences. Well, with me? All right. Okay, so we did an anonymous survey because uh, it's much easier to ask these questions when people don't have to give any identifying information. And because uh, I'm in a school of education with affiliations in psychology and informatics, none of those programs really like you talking about sex a lot with youth. It's really hard to get through an IRB at the main campus. Uh, but if you work with children's hospitals, you can get a lot of, uh, of approval because sexual health is normal, health, is part of health, right? And so we partnered with a local children's hospital um, in Southern California to do the survey. Um, so it was a tablet-based survey for youth 11 to 18 years old and their caregivers. So basically any 11 to 18 year old who owned a cell phone who walked into an emergency department and was offered to participate in the study. The caregivers, we were interested in caregiver responses, but more than anything we wanted caregivers to be having eyes on their own tablet so youth could fill out their own questionnaire in private. Um, we ha only collected data when there was a social worker present. We had five questions that would immediately flag for help, so the iPad had a code that popped up when the nurse took it back, and then it flagged for someone to come in and talk to the youth. There were questions like, how have you learned about sex? And if the answer was like unwanted experience, someone came and talked to you. So we only collected data when social work was present. Um, and then because 11 to 12 year olds are really diverse, that some 11 and 12 year olds are sexually active, and some don't know the names of the body parts, um, it's really hard to create a questionnaire that would sort of fit the whole spectrum. So I had the unique pleasure of cognitive interviewing with 11 and 12 year olds about these topics. And uh, for those of you who haven't done cognitive interviewing, it's where you, you kind of think out loud. You have uh, your participants reframe your questions, paraphrase it, talk about how they answer it, how much cognitive work it is for them to come up with answers. So I had a really fun time with you know sixth graders of like, when I say private parts, what am I talking about? And then watching them turn red and then trying to explain it to me. Um, but we ended up with a survey that we felt would work well um, across our youth. Um, and then we had the at IRB who approved all our materials. Okay, so the youth survey was really about their sending and receiving behaviors. So had they ever received any sex and had they ever sent any? Um, and if yes to either of those, they were asked from whom or to whom, it was a check all that applies, so it could be a, a friend. Romantic partner, interest, and crush are the terms that the young kids said would fit everybody that might be in that catchment area. Um, a friend of a friend, a stranger, or someone else. Then we wanted to know what was sent or received, right? Because sex can have a lot of different characteristics to it. So it could be pictures or videos, they could be memes, they could be images from the internet, cartoons, different things. So we wanted to know um, what kinds of things they were sending, what kind of things they were receiving. We wanted to know if they wanted to see it, was this actually consensual? Um, why they thought the person might have sent something to them um, and how it made them to feel both to send something and to receive something. Um, and then we had a lot of background questions about their demographic characteristics, their um, knowledge or learning about sexting, digital safety, media rules, that kind of stuff. Okay, the caregiver survey was um, administered in either English or Spanish, uh, parents could select, and they reported on their own demographic characteristics as well as their child. They talked about, uh, we asked them about why they had gotten a phone for their child, um, if they had any media rules around it, um, if they had ever talked with their youth about digital safety practices, and then if their child had ever come to them with, to talk to them about things that bothered them on their phone, like having conflicts with others, images that were disturbing, anything of that nature. Okay. So our sample was 317 youth, and as I mentioned, they were like anyone who had a cell phone who showed up in an ED was offered the survey, and 78% of the youth who were offered um, agreed to fill out our survey. Um, and they were pretty evenly split across groups. There was a little bit larger um, of the 17 category. Um, they were predominantly Latine, followed by multi-ethnic, which represents the area in which we collected data in Southern California and where this hospital is positioned. Um, we, about three quarters of them identified as heterosexual, and so we, we define heterosexual as if in your gender identity you recorded yourself as being cisgender, and then when we asked 
who do you like, which was a check all of a, that apply, if you only selected a binary opposite, so if you're a cisgender female and you selected a male, if you're a cisgender male and you selected a female, you're lumped as heterosexual, and everything else was non-heterosexual, or, or, or sometimes called a, a sexual minority in the slides. Um, Four percent of them identified as a gender minority, as either being transgender or bi non-binary. Um, they, on average, got their first phone around age 11, but it was a huge range. Some kids got their first phone at age four, and some not until they were 17. Um, and almost all of them were on social media before the age of 13. Okay, so our caregivers, um, we're, we had a few caregivers whose youth declined, but they completed it. But we had 249 caregivers who match with the youth sample, so we could look at some of those characteristics conjoined. Um, two thirds of them completed the survey in English and a third in Spanish. Um, and they were mainly mothers followed by fathers or other family members. And also like the youth, they were predominantly Latine. Um, and then half of them had about a high school diploma or less. We have a large immigrant community where I was doing my research in Southern California. So the educational attainment was very, sometimes very low, el low elementary all the way up to high school for about half the sample. Um, and then when we looked at income, we chunked it up that if you were a family with less than 40,000, family, a family income of less than 40,000 a year, which is not livable in California, um, we put you as low income. So about half the sample was categorized as low income. All right, any questions so far? I should say, I think I have time for questions afterwards, but if you have any as I'm going along, please feel free to ask them. Okay, so I bet you're wondering, like, what are youth experiences? So I uh, will highlight it for you. So in general, uh, a fair amount of them are receiving sex, right? So it was almost a third of them are receiving sex, um, but it was really uncommon for any of the youth to say that they were sending them, right? Which is a little bit different than the framing we see in the media. Um, and it might be unique to our sample, or it also might be unique to this time post-COVID, mm -hmm. if you can call it post-COVID. Post shelter in place, whatever today is nowadays. Um, so uh, another 8% had reported they had images of themselves being circulated without their consent. These are not the same 8% as the sending. Only three kids overlap between those categories, so it's a different mechanism by how these images are out in the world. Um, and 30% uh, of them reported that anyone had ever talked with them about sexting as a topic. And when we break it down by group, what you find is not unexpected in that, you know, as you get older, you're more likely to proportionally more youth are sexting or having sexting experiences as they get older, but it was still prevalent in the 11-year-old category as well. Um, and then 13 is a big dip, and 14, I'll show you, is a little bit different. So knowing that, like, this is happening, we were really curious, like, who are they receiving sext from? Um, and we were surprised to find that overwhelmingly it's from strangers, that they're mainly being cyber flash. That is the main point of their, the activities they're having. 14 year olds seem to be a little bit different, um, but for the rest of the groups, um, more than anybody else really, it's, it's a stranger sending it to them. Um, so when we look at receiving patterns, we find is that they're mostly being sent images or uh, videos of the person, typically of their body parts. Um, it's mainly being sent from strangers. But interestingly, even when it's not from strangers, they really didn't want it. 80% of those who are receiving any kind of sex didn't want it. Only one youth didn't report not wanting it from a stranger, and even they, from friends, from friends of a friend's, like they don't want to get these images. Um, and it was not as common with romantic partners, crushes, or interests, but um, it was more wanted, not 100% wanted. But that was like the one category where they were at least a little more youth wanted it. Um, and not surprisingly, it's disproportionately females are being cyber flash. Um, so those who had matched samples with their caregiver, when we asked for those ones who were cyber flashed, how many of their caregiver, caregivers told them, to report it, that their youth had talked with them about something disturbing on their phone, and only 16% of those parents had said that their youth had talked to them about something that they had seen on their phone. So then we asked, well then how do you feel on receiving these, these sex that you're getting? Um, and three quarters of them had really negative feelings. They felt grossed out, they felt confused, annoyed, upset, and scared. Um, and a quarter had more positive feelings and these quarter were typically the ones that were sexting, receiving sex from a romantic partner, uh, interest, or crush. So it was a little bit more wanted in that category. So then we did some logistic regressions just to figure out like who is more at risk or likely to be cyber flashed. Um, and so not surprisingly, we found that females are 22 times more likely to be cyber flashed than males and we included trans and cisgender in that category. 
Um, while our black youth was a small portion of our sample, they were 43 times more likely than Latina youth to be cyber flashed, and whites were also one and a half times more likely. Um, and then comparing black and white, uh, black youth were still 32 times more likely to be cyber flashed than white youth. Um, sexual minorities were less likely to be um, flashed, um, but those who had higher family incomes had an increased likelihood of being cyber flashed. Um, and as parent education went down, the likelihood went down as well. Um, and those who reported sadness, we had like the PHQs, a patient health questionnaire asking about mental health, uh, feelings of sadness and anxiety. Those who had higher scores on that were also at increased risk of being flashed. Um, and surprisingly, it wasn't associated with things we thought like age. Like if you got older, you were more, you've had your phone longer, you'd be more likely to have been flashed before, um, and it wasn't, neither was special education, having social media before the age of 13 or any of these other characteristics. Now, sending was not as common as 25 kids in our sample were sending, but we wanted to know sort of who they're sending it to, and not surprisingly, as others have found, boys were more likely to be sending images than girls were. Um, and most often, they sent it to a romantic partner, interest, or crush, most often a picture of themselves. Um, or they send it to a friend, and with a friend, that's interesting, the most common one was memes, like it wasn't, you know, it's a joke, which I have a 12-year-old who's, I'm seeing this a lot now, we're dealing with that. Um, and then followed by pictures of themselves and then of other people. Um, and fortunately, none of them were forced, reported they were forced to send pictures, which was one of our social work flagging questions. So when we look within groups, again, it's not very common, it's not a big thing that we were seeing, but the 14-year-old seemed to be a little unique. Uh, in their sexting behaviors or sending behaviors. And so when we ran some logistic regressions, there's only three things that predicted an increased likelihood of sending these. Uh, one was being a sexual minority, um, which would be the non-heterosexual category, um, being sexually active and uh, having higher parental education. <coughs> Okay, so then again, there were these 25 kids who reported they had images that were being circulated without their permission, um, and uh, they were disproportionately females, and again, only three of those youth had ever reported sending them, so they're coming out in the world in a different sort of way. Um, when we asked who's sending them, we were surprised to find that it was mainly being sent, circulated by strangers, um, and we didn't have questions to think about how they got in strangers' hands because we didn't expect to find that. Um, and then followed by that is romantic interest, which is much more in that revenge porn kind of genre, um, and then friends. When we asked them why they thought people were sharing these images, we got a diversity of answers. Um, it was like a second typo on my slide, sorry. Um, so to brag and show off, to be funny, mean, hurt and embarrassed, for money or for popularity. And then when we asked them, well, what did you do about it? Um, only 24% of you said they had told anybody, most often it was a friend. Only 12% actually told an adult about their images being circulated. So instead what they said is that they mainly hurt, they mainly did nothing or they just cried. And a smaller portion reported hurting themselves, taking drugs or hurting someone or something in their environment. Um, so there were not very adaptive ways to deal with this or to get help or support for it. Um, when we looked at logistic regressions as sort of what might be associated with increased risk of these things circulating, um, age, unsurprisingly, was a little bit higher. Uh, being a gender minority, um, uh, being black versus being white, um, or being sexually active. Okay, so takeaways, and it's kind of a downer. Watch everyone like happy at the beginning of the talk, and then like watch all the faces kind of go down as we progress. Um, so what we're finding is that cyber flashing is a pretty common experience, especially for adolescent females. Um, but sending is not as common, and, and I don't know if that's for our sample or if that would replicate in a more national sample. Um, but proportionally, sexual minorities and sexually active teens are more likely to be sending than other groups. Um, but for the most part, what kids are getting, they don't want it, right? They're being cyber flashed by strangers, but even when it's someone they know, they also don't want it. Um, and what's really concerning are sort of these numbers of, of images that are circulating without consent, mainly by strangers, and we don't really know how they get out there. There's other work in the EU has found uh, that sometimes like images are captured in gym locker rooms, by friends, by other people. So the youth themselves are not part of the recording or capture, but they're suffering the consequences of it. Okay, so if you're a teen and you're sent a picture or video of some genitalia, you might Google, what do I do if send a dick pic? This is like the oracle's answer for you. Maybe the first one is useful if it was texted to you from a phone number. If it was DM'd on social media, it's harder to block. If it was airdropped to you, um, it's even harder. And the rest of them are really bad. A lot of them really engage in communication with that person, right? These recommendations is to reply, to engage with them in some way. 
And if we put the physical response to that, the physical analogy to that, like if your child went to the park and saw that, you would be really upset. You wouldn't take away their phone and get mad. You would call the police. You would tell them, do not talk to that person. Go away, right? But somehow when it's digitally perpetrated, we're not providing any guidance or support in a meaningful way um, to get help. So there's just a lot of unmet needs on this topic, right? So there are state and federal legislation around indecent exposure. There is things about obscene content, especially if it's sent to a minor, but it's really around the mail or in person, not in digital modalities. And we have very few laws around cyber flashing, specifically from my own search. Um, I know Texas has a criminal law, it's a class C felony. Uh, California, it's civil, you can sue for money. Um, and New Hampshire, it's a misdemeanor. Do I have any attorneys, does anyone know of more laws? Um, there's some being drafted, but don't exist. So it's really like I can call the police, but nothing will happen because there is no legal reason for the police to do anything about it. Um, and the platforms seem to be doing very little to protect youth. There's not a clear way to report that. There's not a clear way to document that. There's not a clear way to prevent it. In other conversations we've had with youth for other projects, they'll talk about, you know, well, the snaps disappear. But we know the snaps don't really disappear, right? Like there should be a way that user's information is captured with those lewd images and there could be consequences and it's not there. Um, and I don't know if anyone saw earlier this month, there was a Wall Street Journal article um, about Arturo Bahar's work at Meta and how he repeatedly kept finding that adolescents were victims of this unwanted sexual advances on Instagram and wanting to do something and getting no traction whatsoever, having to dilute the message and then to give up, which then led to this Wall Street Journal article. Um, I recommend reading it if you haven't yet. Um, and then there's just sort of a lack of information about like what's healthy and okay, what are you responsible for, how do you respond? Um, and so there is um, this youth in other countries, we haven't done much in the US, really report about being afraid of being blamed, right? Like if your image is out there, it's your fault, right? Or why would that person feel like they could send that to you? And a lot of youth talk, are afraid about losing their phone or making their parents making them uninstall their app. Um, Ring Rose has a really powerful article um, where they did focus groups with teens and they had them draw the images they were being sent because they obviously don't have, it's a really quite graphic article. Um, but one of the youth reports, like sitting on the couch being snapped, um, a dick pic, and then like trying to hide her phone from her parents and get away from them so she could cry in another room, right? So it's not like you, they're turning to the adult right next to them, shocked and upset when it happens to them. Um, and then there's some evidence, we didn't find it in our sample, but that youth have more coercion of uh, being, being uh, pressured to send or not, um, which is increasing in some of the research. Okay, so on that super uplifting note, um, <laughs> So I was collecting these data, these data at a children's hospital, right? And so whenever I'd run into some pediatric emergency medicine providers, they would say, Stephanie, I'm so glad you're doing this study. Let me tell you about this case I had last night. And every provider had some story. So we thought, well, maybe we should look at pediatric emergency medicine providers because they are first responders, they're mandated reporters, sexual violence against youth is 100% within their wheelhouse of to address. So we thought, let's just survey some providers and see like what they know about these topics. So we did an anonymous survey. Uh, we're still collecting data. We have about 265 uh, pediatric emergency providers who have completed it so far. Um, I think there's about 3,000 boarded in the US and it's just trying to like find them and, and recruit them. So we started with a pediatric emergency medicine listserv where a lot of them subscribe. Um, so we asked like, how are familiar are you with these IBSA terms, right? What do you know about sexting, cyber flashing, sextortion, cyber bullying specific to sexual conduct, not cyber bullying globally. Um, and then porn addiction, which we added in because I'm doing a lot of work with some high schoolers who have concerns around porn addiction. Um, so we added that part as well. Um, we asked how often they were seeing this in their practice and if it was associated ever when they had kids who presented for suicidal ideation or attempts, how much was some of this IBSA associated with that? Um, and how comfortable did they feel addressing these issues that were coming through the emergency department? And if there were supports that they felt that they needed. Um, so when we asked about sexting, they like felt pretty familiar with it, right? Which uh, you all raised your hand as well. Like it's a pretty common thing in the press. And so for the most part, they felt very too extremely familiar with that topic. When we asked about cyber flashing, which we did define for them, uh, they felt not at all to a little familiar with that. Um, although the term is catchy. Like, like raise your hand if you yourself have received or know someone who's received a dick pic or some other kind of cyber flashing. Right, it's not, not zero, right? But we don't ha label it and typically don't talk about it. Um, and when it came to sextortion, there was a little more familiarity, but for the most part, most providers don't, aren't familiar with this concept either. Um, so when we asked like how often do you see patients with concerns around these topi topics, um, over half of them were seeing concerns around sexting um, and up to 17% of them were seeing it on a monthly basis or more often. Um, about a third for cyber flashing, 
um, 40 percent per sextortion, uh, 62 percent we're seeing around images shared without consent, and about a quarter of them we're seeing on, on a monthly basis or more. Um, and cyberbullying related to sexual images, and those are tied because often the cyberbullying is associated with the images. Um, and some of the providers from the stories I heard would say that they have families that come in with pages and pages of text threads of cyberbullying around the images that they present to the ED, they present to the school, but there's no, nothing to do with it, right? There's no law against it, there's, anyway, so there's, a, there's some problems there. Um, and about a third of them were seeing porn addiction. So then we asked, well, when you have kids who present for suicidal ideation or suicidal attempts, uh, how often was that associated with IBSA? Um, and so for sexting, it was actually quite common that kids who are suicidal have had this kind of experience. Uh, same with cyber flashing, uh, sextortion, cyber bullying related to sexual images, um, and porn addiction, right? So these topics are, are associated with much more dangerous behaviors, uh, but are not typically screened for or talked about. So then we asked, well, given these topics, and they're defined for you what they are, like how familiar do you feel from a scale, like a liquor scale from zero to three, from not at all to very? And what you find is it comes to sexting, like providers feel like a little prepared. Uh, cyber flashing, they feel like a little more on the a little side than not at all, but still not great. Same with sextortion. Cyber bullying, they feel a little more confident, but it's still just a little. Um, and for porn use and addiction, they feel the least comfortable with and, and familiar with addressing that. So we asked them what kind of supports would you want in your clinical practice given these topics. So um, the majority of them, they'd like some training and education, right? They would like some tools for reporting. Um, they would definitely want it resources for families or where to direct them to get help. Um, and they wanted some ways to chart it in the electronic medical record so there could be a more permanent documentation of things that were arising. Um, and only 2% felt like there were no supports needed. Okay. So at the end of the survey, they had these op the providers had option like, is there anything else you want to share or that we should know? Um, so there were a chunk of just really disturbing stories of cases that they shared. Um, that those are just a little haunting. But then the rest of them kind of clustered into three main themes. So I'll share those. One is that they're not really screening or asking about this topic, and we heard this consistently in these open-ended responses. Like, I wonder if I'm missing it by not asking. Um, Cyberbullying is probably underreported since we may not specifically ask patients. Um, I think it can be underreported by teens because it has become normalized in their culture and in social media. Um, and providers saying like, I reported that these events occur rarely, however, they're not questions I routinely ask. And I wonder if there's education that could help providers screen in the best possible way. Um, and so the numbers we're seeing are probably an underestimate of what's actually coming through the door because no one's asking about it. Um, but again, if they do ask about it, there's not very much that's actionable currently for helping. They talked about wanting more training and education around this topic, so we have no training on this in pediatric emergency medicine, but it is needed since it has become more common with teens' increased use of social media. Um, and someone said, I probably don't ask, this about, um, ask enough about this in suicidal ideation, homicidal ideation cases. With age gap, I wonder how receptive teenagers would be to open up or receive these questions. And this is a really important piece, right? Because teens are not like small adults, right? <laughs> like there have to be developmentally appropriate ways to talk about it. It's a highly sensitized topic. There's a lot of victim blaming around this topic. And so to find developmentally appropriate ways to do this work um, is much needed. So then we asked about what kind of resources they would need for, for families or for reporting. Um, they said, we'd love to have resources to point families to in these situations as most feel helpless. There should be hard, consistent guidelines for schools on how to handle these increasingly common situations. Um, and we'd love to have like a national database or a reporting line came up a lot of like, I don't like I, I contact social work, I don't know what to do after that. Um, so that's a concern. So takeaways from this is that pediatric emergency medicine professionals, they're, seen, they're not well trained and they don't feel very comfortable about these topics. For the most part, they feel not at all to just a little bit comfortable. Um, but they're seeing it pretty regularly in their practice. And sometimes these uh, IBSA are associated with self-injurious or potentially fatal kind of behaviors for teens. Um, so there's like a lot of things that show up in an emergency department on a monthly basis that you should know how to deal with, right? Um, and so like if you're a pediatric emergency room physician, you probably work 10 to 16 shifts a month. So it, given that number of shifts in a, like an urban or larger hospital, about once a month at least, you're going to diagnose leukemia or some other form of childhood cancer. That's going to come through the door. 
You're probably gonna have a child who has a compromised airway. You're gonna have to intubate or do something major. In Southern California, where I live, you're probably gonna have a kid who has a cockroach in their ear. That <laughs> happens about monthly, right? So they vary in severity, right? But they, you should know how to deal with it. You should be able to recognize it. You should know the next steps of how to do that, right? The problem is that like providers are not asking the questions to even know. But even if the families come in, or if they come in with pages and pages of, of text threads, right, or um, DMs, there's nothing to do with that information, right? The providers don't know where to report it. There's not supports. And unless the child is suicidal or having mental health issues, then you can plug them into mental health services. It does nothing on prevention. It does nothing on perpetrator or prosecution, right? Like there's these other issues. So while they're a great safety net, it's kind of a net with holes because even if they're catching that that issue is, there's nowhere to put them after that. Okay, so takeaways from these two studies that are still underway is that currently the burden is pretty much on youth, right? Like they have to tolerate these unwanted images and videos. They have to figure out their own privacy settings and most social media default to public settings which allow direct messaging, right? Um, uh, airdrop defaults to public so anyone can airdrop. But there's all these things you have to actively do to restrict that. Um, you have to block perpetrators. You have to deal with these privacy violations. You'll have to discuss without being asked you're with your caregivers and your providers when issues do arise and run the risk that you might lose your phone or be blocked from social media or things might happen to you, right? Um, and so there are a lot of safety nets we could have, but we haven't designed them yet for youth, and it's really important, right? There are technological advances, right? Like, we had this conversation at dinner last night. Like, we use, like, age gates as if entering your birthday. It is, like, the only way. It's, like, the 90s technology that, like, per permeates all of these things where there's lots of technological advances and AI processes to recognize, to ban, to do lots of things, right? And we don't have any of those in place. We need legal protections uh, because cyber flashing is not falling under the umbrella of the more in-person or even mailed kind of things. Um, we need professional supports, like educators and, and healthcare providers, like they need to know more about these topics to help educate, promote digital literacy, and to provide more protections and a sense that you could come talk to me if these things are happening to you. And we need these interpersonal skills of how do you talk to youth in ways that they'll report and share and be productive in that process. Um, so a lot more work is needed to support youth uh, to be healthier and thriving in a digital world. Um, I'd like to thank my collaborators and the children, caregivers, and providers that helped us with this data collection. Um, and then I think we get to do some questions, yeah? Great, thank you so much, Stephanie. Uh, it's a really um, nice tie into some of the work that Alex Stamos presented earlier where it was about some of the statistics at scale of what was happening here. We're getting to actually hear from the, the, the kids themselves, which was something we were missing in the, that other larger project. For you, as you, you know, got to interact with these and see some of the kids' responses, is there one takeaway? Like, are you surprised at these rates? Like, thinking about the re reporting of 30% received an 8% out. Th is that something you were expecting, that kind of rate? Or I'm just trying to get a sense from you of like what you think of whether this is a lot or a little. Um, is 0% the acceptable number? You know, what's your sense? Yeah, so my sense is zero is the acceptable number, right? Um, so that, uh, but we, were we surprised? Not so much. I mean, part of why we did the survey was because we were talking with youth, we're with youth a lot, and this was coming up. Um, we were surprised at how little sending there was, that the, the if you look at meta-analyses, and there was just a pretty recent one about two years ago synthesizing, you do find more of this. But we also find that those who have higher ed education, who are white, like there are certain groups that are more likely, and when we disproportionately look at those groups, we're finding those processes. Um, and it's also like the world is different since the pandemic, digital accessibility, contact, everything is different, and so these data need to be updated to understand what's going on. Um, I think we were very surprised at how much strangers were like sending, circulating, doing all these things and how that's a very clearly unmet need in the process. Yeah, the stranger thing really stood out to me as well. There's another pattern that we've been seeing over the last uh, little while around um, the asymmetry of sending and receiving. And so when we you know, look at various kinds of bad activity on the internet, more people receive than send. So question for you would be, do you think this is perhaps related to self-reporting, like, oh, I get it, but no, I would never send because there's a desirability bias? Or do you feel there's something uh, about the internet where there's a fewer, fewer bad actors that are doing most of the poor behavior? 
Um, and so it's this asymmetry between the number of senders and, and how much content they can you know, get out there. Uh, it's a great question, and um, you know, my sense is there probably are like bad actors. I wouldn't be surprised that like a cyber flasher flashes a lot of people, right? Like if they're air dropping, they kind of hit everybody in that area, right? That there's probably those mechanisms. Um, they're reporting it. I don't feel that you would be more embarrassed to being reporting being cyber flashed than to sending in the same way, especially if sending could have just been like emoji. So I don't think that it's just a gross underreporting of one behavior and not the other. Okay. Um, so I do think that it probably has a little bit of both of those pieces to it. Um, but I think there's not a lot of education. So I have a collaborator who um, has done a lot of sexting meta-analyses and uh, we were on a phone call about a year ago and she said, so my daughter got her first dick pic. And I was like, and what'd you do? She's like, well, by the time we talked about, she did tell me, uh, which I think is important in itself, right? Uh, and by then she had already blocked, it was a boy from her school. And I said, and is that it? And she said, yeah. And I said, well, how is that boy supposed to know that's not OK, right? Like, it's still educational at this point, right? We're not talking about, lo like, lock them up. It's not like adult str strangers. But there has to be some education and recourse about why this happens. Um, and we don't see that. And uh, one of the providers that I had talked with, they had um, a kid who uh, a video had leaked. It shared around the whole school. She was very suicidal. Um, they brought you know, tons of documentation to the school. And the school said, well, there's nothing we can do about it. You should probably change schools. And, uh, and, and I was so upset, and I said, no, you bring in law enforcement, you say it's child porn, and if anyone still has this on their phone, they could be prosecuted, delete it, and I think a lot of it would get deleted, right? Like, I think there has to be this teachable moment and a sense of accountability, but currently what we're seeing, and again, these are mainly vignettes because it's not systematically studied as well as it should be, is a lot of victim blaming and a lot of burden on youth, and the adults are not helping mm -hmm. very much. Yeah, yeah. Well, before we get to some of the kind of policy ideas that you might have around this, like you know, this kind of response, uh, just a couple other methodological questions. So, with the with the providers, that was really interesting data. Um, how did you ever get any examples? Like, how does it come up when they're when they're interacting with their students if they don't know to ask for it? Is it sort of like something where the kids like, well, look, here's something that's happened to me that's upset me, or how does it come up in a in a pediatric? emergency conversation. Did you get any sense of that? I only have a sense of it from like when we were doing the youth survey and providers would come up to me a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so oftentimes uh, they would present in the ED, usually a, a, pr a parent had seen something or their child was really upset and found out about something and then came in and they really trust, especially at children's hospital and pediatricians, they really view them as these safety nets and brokers who are gonna help them. And so they come in for a, like, you know, working in the space, they come in for a lot of different reasons. So this is one where they do actively share. I think that part of the history um, when kids are suicidal talks about like, what kind of contributing factors there are, and I think it emerges there. But I didn't get any sense that um, youth, that providers were asking youth just kind of on a daily basis. I know my own kids taking them to checkups, um, you know, the adolescents now have time alone with the provider. Yeah. When I ask afterwards, like, oh, did she ask you anything about, they're like, nope. Like, so I just don't think it's part of what's normative practice on histories right now. Gotcha. And so if that was sort of implemented, that would be one new kind of policy where that would be an explicit question they could ask. Which would be great. But then the question is, what happens next? Right. And we don't have a what happens next very clearly articulated. Right. right. So let's get to that. You've laid out a number of stakeholders that could play a role uh, from law enforcement to school to family to peers. Um, have you all started working on some specific ideas uh, or is it more like here are things that need to be done, but we don't know how to implement? Um, I'm, I'm frankly kind of new to these policy questions too, so just throwing them out there and other people may have ideas, but do, have you started to form those? Um, so again, I'm not a policy person either. Um, from our review, it seems like there's a glaring absence of laws, right? Like to actually make things prosecutable, reportable, right? And for like a 15 year old in California to report so they can sue for money, like that's not gonna help other kids, right? Like mm -hmm. that's not the mechanism we really need here. Um, so as, uh, do I have any attorneys in here? Is there anyone here who speaks? Yeah, is there, <laughs> are there policies? Are there any? No, so I think there's like a big legal gap right here, that's a big part. Um, that, that sort of excludes law enforcement as a stakeholder. Right, so law enforcement, I think, could do at least do more education. I think law enforcement could still talk to youth about why it's, right? So I think there's those pieces. As a developmentalist, I would love schools and caregivers to have conversations about um, respect your body. Like, we, you know, sex education is kind of 
diminished a lot in the United States, right? So we don't learn about like reciprocal pleasure, your body, your rights, autonomy. There's like a whole bunch of these things, which probably factor in at least for the peer part of cyber flashing, right? Or the adolescent to adolescent part. Um, so I think there's a lot of education and capacity mm -hmm. in those spaces. Um, and we don't have responses for caregivers, right? So even if you have a nice relationship with your child where they feel like they trust you enough to really share what's happening with them, if you can't do anything about it, right, then that's a huge gap as well. Mm -hmm. um, so even if like there were hotlines or reporting or advice, like we, I mean, in my sense, I, I, there's just nothing there really meaningfully at yeah. scale. Yeah, great, okay, well thank you so much. Let's open up to uh, questions uh, in the room. So clearly, <coughs> the health professionals want resources, and there's a dearth of resources. Is there anything right, are there any resources right now you could refer a health professional to other than uh, uh, a patient might be suicidal, they can refer them to mental health, but for other uh, uh, youth that have problems, is there anything existing right now? No, I mean, so there's like helplines, right? There's like 988, there's groups you could talk to. Like I think we have resources where youth could talk to somebody for that kind of help. It's not gonna stop perpetrator, it's not gonna stop the issue bigger, but I think in that immediate moment when you need to talk so to somebody, we have that increasingly available. Um, but that's all I really can think of that like at a larger level is really available. Um, most of the providers in our survey said they, oh, I just call social work, <laughs> like social work can deal with it. So maybe that's my next survey is figure out what social work does then when it gets to them because I don't know what their next step typically is. Great, thanks. Hi, <clears throat> thank you so much. I'm so excited. Uh, very quickly, uh, I come from another planet. It's called Latin America. <laughs> and I've we been to your planet, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and we have documented this for years. Uh, not only because soci in, in society body autonomy is far more uh, abused in places where there's a more conservative culture, but also because a lot of what is allowed in social media is tested in other places. Mm -hmm. uh, there's very extensive, beautiful work done by a ton of people. I'd like to put you in touch with them. However, there's a question that they always start with, and that is the autonomy of the child, the sexual autonomy, or the, the independence for a child to decide what they want to do. So my question is, how do you respect the freedom of a person and their independence while a survey has been done where the most embarrassing thing has been told in front of their caregiver? Why do you wait until a person is suicidal to document and I'd love to talk more about this, but those two seem very important to me right now. Yeah, I know, I think that's great. Um, and they're really important. And so part of why we only collected data when social work was present is because if anything was triggering, the youth was talked to alone with the social worker and not with their caregiver. Like, oh, we noticed. And about one in five youth flagged for somebody to come talk to them in our sample. So, because it was prevalent enough, right? Um, so that's at least one way to respect in the, in the research side of things. But the autonomy part is really important. And this is why the safety nets have to be multifaceted, right? Your, your safety net can't be just telling your caregiver or calling the police, right? It has to be multiple ways. You should be able to report on social media and block that person or have some or put something into action. You should be able to call a helpline or get, find out what your options are. You should be able to decide if you want to tell your parent, right? Like we should support adolescent autonomy. And the more options we have for how to address these issues, the more we're doing that. And currently it's really lacking. We have a, a question online. Um, so what are one or two things you think the tech platforms could be doing to improve these dynamics? Um, do you have any I ideas for how they could lessen the burden on children? Um, yes, and I'm sure people in the room know a lot more about the design part because I'm the kid part of it. Um, but so my sense is that like in working with youth and, and how they navigate digital platforms, especially social media, is everything is an opt out option, like you get a completely open, non-protected space, and because in the age gate, you put your age in as 100, typically, well, that's what the youth we talk to, they put in crazy ages, that should be red flags on themselves, right? And everything's open, 
and you have to find and block, right? And if you've ever, I don't know if any of you have opened a public account and then tried to opt out, it's like many menus to find all the pieces and you have to know what the word is called to be able to say, I don't want tally likes or, you know what I mean, like whatever the thing is. Um, so I think the tech department should, I think tech should have an opt in and not an opt out as a default. I think age gates are ridiculous. Right? Our technology is so much more sophisticated. We're doing content analysis of underage TikTok and Snapchat and Instagram accounts right now. Um, they say in their bio, uh, I'm 10 and I'm single. Like that's a pretty like easy to find account, right? And we find hundreds, we just literally put in 10 YR, T-E-N-Y-R, 10 Y-E-A-R, right? And we, like hundreds just pop up, pop up, pop, right? So there's like little protection just on that basic self descriptor. But their faces are kids. Their pros are kids. They're friends with other kids. Like there's so many ways to know they're underage. Like an age gate is a ridiculous standard, right? Like that, you can find them very easy. So I think even just at the basics of that, and then if you really know these are children's accounts and everything is set to private unless you choose it to be differently, you've shut the access for a lot of it, right? So our survey didn't look at this, but a lot of work in the EU finds that like airdrop is a huge one. Um, and every time you update your phone, it goes back to all contact, you know, like all open to everyone. Um, they find that d DMing, like direct messaging through social media platforms. And if you have a public account, anyone can message you, right? Like these, these default things are very quick and easy to do. Um, and then more sophisticated things about where to report, where to upload the images, to put the time in which it happened, like those kinds of things would be fantastic as well. Yeah, great, those seem pretty simple. Thank you, Stephanie, for coming and presenting. Uh, I was wondering if in your study you were able to dig into the effect of parental education in, uh, in, in the response of kids who receive these images, and is there, does their response differ by parental education? Uh, no, in general, like our findings, I mean, and granted, it's a very broad, like, we, you know, correlations between these, but those who had parents with higher education were at increased risk of being cyber flashed and um, uh, sending things themselves. So it was uh, parental education was actually more of a risk factor or increased probability in our sample. Um, but parental education also accompanies more financial resources, more technology, right? There's a lot more that goes along with education. That's probably not the education piece of it. So I know you were looking primarily at the receiving, but I'm just curious if there's research on whether these are primarily being sent by actual individuals who are strangers sending pictures of themselves, or are these bots or phishing whatever where people are taking one picture and sending it to a ton of people to try to pull people in? Do we know what the sort of supply side uh, is on driving this? I don't. Um, <laughs> it's a great question, um, and it'd be important. Like, I think I feel a little more comfortable if it was like one person in a bot, or you know, or something, versus it's a whole bunch of people. Whenever you're in a stadium or walking on, you know, on a bus, um, I, I don't know. Um, I know that others who have done research um, report all kinds of things from peers, uh, like other youth users, whether they're known to them or not, as well as adults. Um, and, uh, and some of them are, are more graphic, like masturbatory videos or things, not just a picture, right? There's more to it. Um, and so I think it's a really great area of research. I think there's a lot of technical proficiency in this room to try to address that question. It's an important one. Great. Um, one other question I had is sort of like a difficult one maybe, but if you know, you're, you're, you're a mother of two and you know, if they were to come to you as a parent, what are some of the responses that you might say that other parents would maybe learn from your response? I think that's a great question. So a par I'm a parenting researcher as well. It's a big area of my research, um, which is maybe to the good or bad of my own children. Because uh, mm -hmm. I, and I do have those moments where I'm like, this is how I'm gonna handle it. And I think, why are these words coming out of my mouth? This is not <laughs> what I wanna do. Um, so my sense in parenting in a digital world in general is around capacity building. And so uh, starting at a very young age, um, we have communication and consistent rules about everything and the process has gr gradually unfolded as they've gotten older. Um, my oldest, who's now 16, gives me so much credibility uh, as a media researcher, and she, I think it's uniquely who she is. But we talked about algorithms, privacy, text message, drama, conflict, like growing up, so that when she got to be at an age we thought was appropriate to have a phone, we asked her if she wanted a phone. And she said, I just don't think I want that kind of digital algorithm out there, and I, there's so much drama with my friends that I don't have to be a part of because I'm not on these threads. Um, and uh, if you really need to get me, all my friends have a phone, you could always call me. 
Uh, so she opted out, and at the end of eighth grade, before I started high school, we said, you should have a phone, because you have to have one in high school, and you need the summer to figure it out. And she was like, okay. Anyway, so <laughs> um, her younger brother, who's in seventh grade, and maybe the only seventh grader without a phone, um, uh, is now um, creating his own plan. He, he basically had to come up with the rules. He, you know, so his birthday's next month, he'll be 13. And that was when we, you know, but since he was 12, we're like, we feel like you're old enough. You just have to show you're mature enough. And we delineated what that was. And, um, and he hadn't dis displayed it yet, so it got pushed back. But anyway, he comes up to me and says, so I've been thinking about my media roles, and this is what they're going to be. Like, I'm not telling him. He comes up with them. And so I think that uh, we're a unique family in that process. So when things have come up, uh, there was, like, a meme when he was in fourth grade that circulated of um, uh, some sex acts in, with SpongeBob characters. It was very traumatic for the fourth graders. He came to me and was like, you're not going to believe what I saw on so-and-so's phone. You know? And the school got really mad about it. And we had this long conversation about it, and he came to me right away. Uh, my daughter, fortunately, knock on wood, has not gotten any of those, but some of her friends have. And so part of it, it's a very long-winded answer, of um, building capacity and trust and communication, and that's part of parenting. And, uh, and digital spaces are just one more aspect of parenting. It's just one more context in their developmental process. So ideally, if you talk with your kids about everything, so they feel like they can come to you, right? Like you talk about what kind of social media, what video games they're playing with, how they feel, what they like, what they don't like, you know, then that door is open for them to walk through when something they really don't want comes. Uh, but for the most part, uh, a lot of parenting around media is very isolated. Parents are engaged in their own right. phones, kids are on their own phone, right? And so it, you're not having this communication. And I think that part is really needed to create an ecology in the family where whatever comes through your device, you're gonna talk about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really like that capacity building idea and the idea that it's not that much different than, say, the real world, so to speak. But I think one challenge that parents have is they don't, they feel like they're not prepared to do that capacity building online. But I think, so that's an area, I think, from a policy point of view that, that parents could receive a lot of help. Yeah, I mean, from a policy point of view, like, we get nothing. Is that, raise your hand if you have a kid. You like give birth and you, they sometimes say like, watch this video at the hospital and I'll make sure you have a car seat and go <laughs> ahead, right? Like that's it. If you wanna learn to drive, you take a class, you take a test, you have to do 50 hours, you have to work with a certified driver, you take another test, right? Uh, but kids are like, just have at it. You know, mm -hmm. so I think from a policy standpoint, we should provide more supports for parenting across the board. Mm -hmm. uh, this just being one of those important aspects that we haven't added to it. Yeah, great. Well, I think we should uh, end on that uh, lovely uh, and inspiring answer. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Stephanie, for that. Thank you, everybody. Bye -bye. And um, join us uh, next week for our final uh, seminar of this series. Uh, it's with our very own uh, Vicki Harrison, who, like Stephanie, works a lot with kids and really listens to their perspective. And I think you'll enjoy her talk. So see you, uh, see you then. And uh, thank you once again, Stephanie. Really appreciate it.